Welcome back to The Average Kitchen. Mark here with a C. Today, we are gonna be doing, new for us, the Instapot Precision Dutch Oven. Really cool cast iron pot and lid that's removable, will go right into your oven if you want. And we're gonna make a slow cooker Guinness stew. So as you can see here, I've got everything lined up to make this amazing stew that I've made several, several times. We have, and you can see it's just starting to smolder here, We preheat our Dutch oven on the sear saute function. I threw in, I think about three tablespoons of avocado oil, and I've got some beef that I mixed up with some, a little bit of flour. What was that? What was that? Oh. <laughs> I'm not used to that sound. I'm like, what was that? Mixed in a tablespoon of flour and a tablespoon of cornstarch, and I'm gonna get that in here and we're going to brown up our beef. So I would say that is hot, given that it's smoking our avocado oil, which has a very high smoke point. So by browning our beef like this, it's going to give it a nice coating on the outside. It's also, with the cornstarch and the flour, it's also gonna help thicken our stew. Um, towards the end of our cook, we're probably gonna make a slurry. And if you're not familiar with that, essentially it's cornstarch and water cold water, equal parts cornstarch, equal parts water. And what that does is pretty much instantly with roughly two tablespoons of cornstarch, two tablespoons of water, instantly thickens up your stew or your sauce or whatever you're making. So that's starting to brown up nice. We're gonna hit it with a little bit of salt and pepper. So what I'm gonna do is, once my beef is done browning up here, I'm gonna pull it out of my pot and then we're gonna deglaze our pot with some beef stock and then we're gonna throw in carrots, celery, onions, two heaping tablespoons of tomato paste, two tablespoons of minced garlic, and we're gonna get that cooking and add our beef back in, and then we're gonna throw in our lovely Guinness pint. Now I've been to Ireland twice. Guinness in the can here in Canada is good. <laughs> There's nothing better than getting a nice pint of Guinness in Dublin. So as you may or may not be able to see, sometimes when you're cooking your beef like this, especially when you've got a little bit of uh, cornstarch and flour on it, there tends to be these little sticky parts on the bottom that stick. That's okay, that's gonna be part of our deglaze process. Then we're gonna use this flat handle wooden spoon to kind of scrape up those little bits because essentially those little bits equal flavor. So that's good for us. So I'm quite impressed, again, first time using this, quite impressed with how hot this actually gets. Like this is, well Jamie said it's 400. Now is that, was that temperature adjustable, Jamie? You could drop it down. Um, so it's quite hot, which is nice. A couple of little accessories that this came with that I'll show you while our beef is browning. These two little pot handles. Now, if your cast iron is like ripping hot, you may want to initially be cautious with these, but essentially they fit on here. So you could just lift your pot right out if, if need be. And then it's got a little silicone mat to lay your uh, pot on when it's hot to protect your countertop. So I thought that was kind of neat. All right, we're starting to brown now. So I think that's pretty good. I mean, it all depends on how brown you want to uh, do your beef, but we're gonna pull that out. So I just got a, a plastic spoon here. We're gonna throw that into a bowl. That'll give the beef a, a couple minutes to rest. So you could probably see here, Jamie, if you get a kind of a tighter uh, view, that we definitely have some um, spots that stuck here. We got four cups of beef stock here. We're gonna throw in our four cups of beef stock. Now, as that's starting to warm up, uh, we can scrape carefully, not to make a mess and spill it, but just scrape our bottom of our pot to get all of that sort of goodness off the bottom. So I can already feel there's almost nothing left stuck on the bottom here. So essentially that becomes Flavor Town. Flavor Town. So I must say, I've always never been, I've never really been that good at sort of measuring by, by visually like how big something is. When I looked at the size of this pot, I was like, okay, I hope the whole stew fits in it. But now that I put in four cups of beef stock, there's quite a bit of room there. So um, I may, depending on how, when all this comes together, I may end up adding a little bit more beef stock. And that's really optional for you. It's not really gonna adjust or change your flavor at all, but it, it, it will result in how much uh, broth you have or gravy or um, stew uh, liquid 
that you want comparable to the rest of uh, the ingredients that you have. So it's starting to warm up. So before it's too hot, I'm gonna throw in my carrots, which that was roughly like three good sized carrots, three stalks of celery, and uh, half of a quite a large onion. So we're gonna get that just starting to warm up here. So now we can switch, now that the sear saute portion is done, we're gonna switch to slow cook. So we're just gonna go cancel. And we're gonna go to slow cook. And we're going to go start. So it defaults to four hours. So um, this is again starting to warm up. Of course I forgot, I just thought of now, I have potatoes on the table here that I cut up that I need to add as well. So give me a second to grab those and we're gonna get those in the pot as well. All right, sorry for that minor interruption there. Uh, like I said, I had potatoes cut, prepped, ready to go, sitting in cold water. Uh, I just didn't bring them over to the island here. So that's probably roughly three or four good sized potatoes. Again, depending on how big of a stew that you wanna make and depending on what the ratio, some people um, like less potatoes or more potatoes, so that's totally up to you. Okay, so we still have enough liquid that everything's covered, so we're still good in that regard. We're gonna throw in our tomato paste. So I have a question for all of my loyal Average Kitchen followers. Sometimes we throw out these kind of funny things uh, to back to you to get your opinion. So recently, uh, our editor, Dan, was at my place and he uh, had a big cast iron pan of mine. And we were doing a bunch of pizzas in the wood-fired oven and he was, uh, I think he was caramelizing onions or something and he was scraping that pan like vigorously with a big metal spoon. Metal on metal, which made me cringe. Then I'm like, Dan, what are you doing? He's like, dude, it's cast iron. It's indestructible. You cannot harm it at all. Whoa, 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 Mark, all right? Enough of the accusations here. I want to make sure that our audience here sees exactly what went on near the barbecue, all right? So I did indeed use a metal spoon on Mark's cast iron pan. But I think unlike Mark, what he's saying is that I was like, gouging into it and scratching it. I was merely using the spoon to move around some mushrooms. So here's what I was doing. I was going like this. Was it making noise? I think it was. Mark was perhaps rightfully so alerted. But for me at home, I use metal spoons like this on cast iron. Does it perhaps damage a little bit the seasoning? I think in the long run it doesn't matter. Anyways, I just wanted to say my piece, all right? Back to the regular program. Oh yeah, I forgot to add. Only two things don't touch my cast iron. Soap and fish. So my question to you, our Avid Kitchen uh, viewers, is who's right here? Like would you cringe and maybe not use metal on metal on cast iron? Do you say give her gas? Doesn't matter, it's indestructible. So leave us a comment. We'd love to hear your opinion on that. I think I'm right. Dan is convinced he's right. We're gonna leave it up to you to let us know who's, who's right and who's wrong. All right, so we just got our garlic in. Gonna give that a stir. This already looks unbelievable. Obviously you can't smell it through the camera, but it smells good and we haven't even added our pint of Guinness yet. So let's get our beef back in. And you're probably gonna see there's gonna be some residual liquid at the bottom of our bowl. I'll try to pour that in with you being able to see. You don't wanna give that away. We want that in there as well. There we go. Again, we're gonna stir that up. So by looking at this, I think the pint of Guinness is gonna get us just to the perfect level here. Obviously your vegetables are gonna release liquid as they start to cook down. So I think liquid wise, we're gonna be perfect, but let's open up this beautiful can of Guinness. Now you'll just see how that just coats the top here and it's just gonna add this amazing level of creaminess Oh, that's nice. So of course, as most people know, there's a widget, it's called, in the bottom of a, can, a pint of Guinness. And I always find if you let it sit for a minute or two, uh, you maybe get another tablespoon, half a tablespoon out of that can. So we're gonna slowly mix that up. And as this is cooking, you're gonna wanna taste your broth for uh, your desired level of salt and pepper. What, what do you like? I think that our liquid level is perfect. Would you agree, Jamie? Yes. Perfect liquid level, which is really, really nice. We'll get a little bit more Guinness, and we don't want to waste it. All right, so now, essentially, we're gonna give that four, five hours to sit. 
simmer and become this unbelievable stew. It is the summertime here in Canada, so this is generally not a summertime meal here, but I thought what better way to test this product, new product for us, than to make a Guinness stew. So great winter meal, but depending on where you are in the world, you may not even get snow in winter like we do here, but this is a real nice, homey, uh, really, really nice comfort meal here in Canada. Lids on, beautiful looking product. I must say though, heavy. Like, with nothing in it, it's probably, what would you say the pot and pan is, or the pot and lid is, Jamie? Seven pounds? Yeah. Seven pounds maybe? So maybe 10 pounds total, empty for the whole product, maybe a little bit more, um, but pretty bulky. So. Let's give us uh, four or five hours and we'll come back and see how it looks. So let's have a look. So it's certainly looking good. It's not there yet. The vegetables are still firm, which is good, but still have a little bit to go. The broth is looking nice, but it's still a little bit thin for my liking. So we're gonna have to do a slurry for it. But I always am cautious with doing slurries. I like to do them right at the end because depending on how thick you like it, if you like a thicker sauce, you don't want to thicken it and then let it sit for two or three hours because you, you, you would have cause for concern for burning it if it's too thick and it, it would stick to the bottom. So I would make sure that you get all your vegetables and the beef tender in the way you liked it, like it and then do your slurry. So it's funny, I was saying, Jamie, it looks super hot, but it's not crazy hot. Beef tastes great. That's hotter than the broth, but it's still not that fall off the well, it's not, there's no bone, but you know what I mean? That really super, super tender texture that we want. So we're gonna throw that lid back on. So the biggest complaint with this product, and it was Jamie who identified that kind of right at the beginning, and it may be hard to see on camera. The screen is so dim, it's almost impossible to read unless you're like, now I'm not a young guy anymore, but it's pretty hard to read. So that's my biggest complaint. So the average kitchen came up with this scoring matrix that we run through six series of scores to come up with an overall score out of 10 on a product. And our scoring matrix is price point, functionality, versatility, cleaning, size, and quality. So the first one, price point, 6.8. And the reason why that's a little bit on the lower side is this is pretty expensive. It was close to $300, it's even more now, close to $300 with tax. I mean, it's a great product, it's heavy duty, it's really nice, but it's expensive. Functionality, it functions really, really well. Um, we gave that an 8.4 out of 10. Everything works great on it. Really nice to be able to, uh, and maybe that's a segue into the next category of versatility. If you make something for a family get together or whatever, rather than having to bring everything and plug it in, you just bring that pot and maybe I can pull it out and show you. You just literally pull that out and take that with you wherever you need to go. And then it could just get thrown into the oven, thrown into the oven and warmed up that way. So that's kind of a nice feature. So versatility, we gave that an eight. Cleaning, we gave it an 8.5 because the pot and the lid, because there's an, like an enamel coating on it, um, and maybe that's not the right word, but there's a coating on the cast iron, very, very easy to clean. The size, it's quite compact, yet, you know, 5.7 liters is a good size and you can put a, a large volume of soup or stew or casserole or wherever, so we're good with the size, 7.7, .7, and the quality, we think it's actually really well, well made. Heavy duty, again, 20 pounds this product, 8.3, with an overall score of eight even on our average kitchen uh, matrix. Also, if you're looking to buy that and you want this exact model, we put the link in the description of the video so you can just click on that link. It'll take you to your Amazon, wherever you are in the world, so that you know that you're getting the one that we are reviewing specifically. Because I noticed, maybe not as much with Instant, but definitely with Ninja, They'll have the same product, but it'll have like five different model numbers. I don't know why. I don't know what the difference is. Jamie and I've never figured it out. But anyway, so this specific model that we're reviewing today, the link is in the description. So that's our video. We hope you liked it. If you want to support us, the best thing you can do is subscribe, hit the notification bell, and don't forget, leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you and we'll get back to you. If you have any questions or any suggestions on future videos that we should shoot, let us know.